Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Why Bother with your host, John Sobleski, the podcast that didn't need to be made by the host who really didn't want to make it. Today, I am joined with the ever so talented Mary Ruth Rera, personal chef, culinary expert, and good friend. We are going to talk about all things food, and we're really, really excited to have her with me today. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce to you my guest for this afternoon, Mary Ruth Rara. Hi, Mary Ruth. Hey, John. How are you? I am great. How are you doing today? I'm doing great as well. I, I'm so excited to talk to somebody who knows what they're doing in the kitchen and uh, not just a YouTube disaster. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we just don't broadcast my disasters. Well, there you go. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Mary Ruth, I met you a few years ago when uh, your husband and I were working on a film project and you were in charge of all uh, the food. And I don't know if you remember this, but uh, you had sent Lou, uh, your your husband, a giant container full of different snacks and and fruits and breads and cheeses. And uh, and you told him, OK, there you go. Good luck. And uh, Lou was like a was like lost in a in a, a candy store. I didn't know what to do. And I said, "Oh, I got this." And the next day, there was a note that said, "John, take care of this, Mary Ruth." <laughs> so. Isn't it? I don't even remember that. He, Lou must have made um, told me that I could only be confident in you handling. <laughs> <laughs> craft services and the catering for that film shoot oh, and that no. I couldn't rely on him as much. <laughs> but it was still fun because I thought we bonded there. And then uh, you made this delicious dish uh, for the wrap party. Uh, it was like pork tenderloin tacos. And I remember you had a, a pineapple salsa or something that was, uh, yeah. oh, it was fantastic. I had never, yeah. never forgot it. I mean, that was a nice hot summer day too. That would be, that would be definitely something I would have served. I know we had that meal in our backyard. Mm -hmm. um, that is exactly the uh, funnest and perfect kind of food to eat on a hot summer day is something, something Mexican with a nice um, fresh salsa. Oh, it was delicious. So why don't we take the opportunity right now to talk a little bit about you, uh, your journey to where you are today uh, and, and uh, you know, introduce Mary Ruth, the chef. Okay, John. Well, uh, the story is um, pretty, I, it could, it, I could talk about it for three days or I could give you the three minute de de Reader's Digest version because it actually, my whole life led up to me becoming a chef but I never really saw that happening um, the whole time. And it's not like when I was young, I wanted to be a chef. Um, I was sort of just trying to find my way for many, many years. And uh, without a, a clear vision of, who, of what I wanted to do and who I am. Uh, so I tried several different careers and I was in banking and I was in television and um, I waitress. Of course, I don't think anyone considers that necessarily their career, but I did it, you know, trying to find myself and um, tried a whole bunch of things, just um, kind of throwing stuff at the wall. Um, and then I realized uh, I got to be in my 30s, actually. So this is how long it took that I was really just drawn to the kitchen. I was wanting to cook for uh, family and friends as often as possible. And I really was being, um, and I was drawn to a lot of television shows that were on the Discovery Channel and also on the Learning Channel. And they were preparing dishes and it was show, it was food that I, I couldn't get here. It was, I was realizing like, wow, that is amazing. That looks amazing. And how do I get to taste that? And I realized that there was no way to really get that food without me making it myself. And I just wanted to constantly be trying that. And, um, there was a woman who had a cooking show in the 90s. She's She passed away this past year, but her name is uh, Biba Caggiano, and she had a, an Italian cooking show. It was one of the shows I was watching, but it was practically, I would say it was my favorite. And um, she was a woman who was from uh, the Bologna region, uh, of the Emilia Romagna region of Italy, mm -hmm. uh, the city of Bologna. And I would hear her stories and I would watch her make the food. And we're talking about freshly made gnocchi and pasta and risotto and vegetables and, and just wonderful preparations of dishes that I could tell were the food I wanted to eat but didn't know how and couldn't get it at restaurants. Mm -hmm. I think 
that was one of the things that was frustrating was like, why isn't Italian food available like that to me here? Why, why is this, why does this seem so far away? Anyway, so I started cooking the food myself, just, I was self-taught for quite a while. And um, at one point I woke up, I was working at Channel 7 at, the point, at that time. In 1996, I was 33. And I said, what well, could I do? What would I do with my life if I could do anything, if money wasn't an issue and mm-hmm. I could walk into any kind of job? And I wanted to be, I knew I wanted to cook. What I really also knew at the same time was I did not want to be in a restaurant. Mm-hmm. I just love cooking with, um, for people I love. So, but I, that's why I chose not to go to a culinary school here in the States. And I said, well, if I'm going to do this, I want to cook. I want to be taught by the people who sure. really want to learn from. So sure. I was to move to Italy and I was, I saved my money for a year and a half and uh, booked the fl- I, I remember booking the flight almost a year and a half out. And I, it was one of the few things in my life that didn't like have a plan B. I booked it for September 1st, 1997 with, with US Air and that flight that I never had to change the time. I never had to change uh, the date. And I left on September 1st, 1997. And um, th- that's a whole uh, other story of <laughs> landing in Italy and not knowing the language so well. Um, but ended up in Florence. The school is a Scuola di Arte Culinaria in Florence and um, changed my life forever. Best decision ever. And then I was on a new path, a new, the, the track I was meant to be on all those years before, but just never knew it. Sure. That's how I, it was, it was the, the, um, the lure of Italian, authentic Italian cooking that made me want to become a chef. That is fantastic. And you know what you hear more and more throughout uh, now that people are able to tell their stories like this, that a lot of times people are doing something with their day-to-day life and they're like, this, I'm not feeling fulfilled. And it's that risk that just taking that jump and seeing what happens. So you pretty much just moved across the world to follow this dream, which is fantastic because how many people can say that they've done that? Right. You know, um, I, I just encourage and younger people, especially, (laughs) Um, anyone who has a thought of either cooking or um, a, a, the, has the wanderlust to travel, I say do it. Don't question it. You will land on your feet. That's fantastic. That's great advice. Now, can we talk a little bit about culinary school? So to sure. put it into perspective, the only thing I know about culinary school is what I saw in Julie and Julia with <laughs> Meryl Streep. As Julia Child, okay. <laughs> it was fun. I read the book. Yeah. So it, the movie was a little much, but I did like. Yeah. I I just I just remember watching uh, her at Le Cordon Bleu. Now that's French cooking, completely different than what you're you're referring to. But I just remember uh, lots of men standing around and a lot of onions being chopped and a lot of knives being thrown. So it's just. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what culinary school is like um, and what somebody who may be interested in becoming a chef uh, would go through to get to that point. And this is what you can expect uh, in a true culinary school, which is one of the reasons I chose the school I went to, because, you know, what you'll see if you if you uh, look up cooking schools, especially in Europe. So if you're talking France and Italy, you're going to find a lot of cooking schools. But those are a lot of them. Maybe most of them are cooking schools you would go to as a traveler and you would take a cooking class or two mm-hmm. and you would learn to make a dish. You would learn some things about fresh ingredients. You might even learn a little, some knife skills. Um, but even back in 1996, I knew I didn't want to go to a touristy cooking school. I wanted a degree. And this is back before the internet was the internet. Mm-hmm. It's- 1996. I mean, I'm sure I was on some AOL dial-up and it was taking <laughs> five minutes to complete each and every search. <laughs> school in Florence that um, offered this professional program. And what you should expect, what, what um, anybody who wants to do this should expect is that it is not just about how, how delicious the food is. It's about being serious in the kitchen. It's about using the best ingredients and respecting um, the space and working with others in the kitchen and learning the 
classic preparation of what we, so if you're in a French school, you're going to learn classic preparations of all these dishes that are have been prepared by chefs for all of these years. Um, in the school I went to in Florence, um, it was, it's run by women. Now, what I want to just say today is that that school that I went to has grown and they've moved to another location just a couple of blocks away in Florence. And these women, this, this women run business is doing extremely well, coronavirus aside. Um, this school that they started has grown and they offer, I mean, it, it, now it, the professional program that I took has now expanded. And um, what it, it's a very serious venture. So I guess what I want to say is anybody who wants to become a chef, whether they go to Europe or even, you know, they go to a school in Buffalo, mm -hmm. um, learn to that you're to, to open your mind and your heart and be ready to learn. Um, you whatever it is you know, put it aside, keep it in the bag, and, and let yourself learn from the experts of of whatever they're teaching you. And those skills are something whether you become a chef or not, you will carry with you the rest of your life. That's really, really interesting because I think that a lot of times, especially in this generation, and I was talking about this with a, a guest I had last week, is that there's that need for instant gratification. Like if we can't figure it out now, we're not interested in doing it. Where what you're talking about is really listening to the time-honored skill set and traditions of what makes cooking cooking. So would you, would you say that maybe we're living in a society now where the art form where that was that was studied uh, as chefs studied for years, maybe being thrown to the wayside in that of just trying to get YouTube fame and people aren't really I focusing. That, I think that that need for something that is time honored has come back, and maybe the pandemic has something to do with that. But there's something to be said for 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 doing something that requires a little bit of time and thought. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Sh proper planning and shopping and things like that, rather than being instant, rather than just opening a box and having it taste as good as you think it should, but it really doesn't taste good at all. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to taste good. Um, <laughs> whether that's frozen pizza or, you know, a box cake mix. I mean, I could go on and on about things that do provide instant gratification, but all it really is doing is providing bad health. So, um, uh, there is something to be said for taking a step back, taking a breath, and doing something that requires a little bit of time and thought. That's that's great. And I hope that uh, our listeners really take that in because I think that can be said with anything. If you're going to do anything, you should know everything about what you're doing. I don't care if it's painting a picture. I don't care if it's cooking a dish. I don't care if it's you know building a building. You should know everything. And, you know... I, I think that we really just cut to the chase a lot. You know, we, we get to that. Okay. I want to do this. It didn't work out. I move on. So I, I really appreciate what you said with that. So that's and in one of the other quick things I wanted to mention is be sure. ready to, to have mis make mistakes and have a disaster and shrug it off and just come back again and try again. I, I mean, I probably, if I added them up, I would, you know, I don't want to know the list of failures. I've had versus the list of successes because I'd hate to see how close those numbers match. But you just, I mean, it's like anything. It's its just food. Yeah. So the next day, don't be, don't throw in the towel just because something burned or something stuck to the pan or something, you know, you added a little too much salt. Yeah. Oh, that's, 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 do, that's it over. do it again, you know? Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about this. So, uh, you have a couple different avenues of cooking that you've done. You've been a personal chef and you've also ran a, uh, run a catering business. Right. So can we talk a little bit about what sure. exactly a personal chef is other than I'm just not feeling like cooking for myself and I'm going to pay somebody to do it. What, what do you actually do? Well, a, the, a, a real personal chef is um, form is his, is about forming a relationship with the people that they cook for. So I, and we'll get to it probably in a bit, but like right now I have a personal chef business, but it's more where I'm making the food. I, I work with the clients and I make the food and I drop it off at their homes. That's a version of being a personal chef that makes sense for this area. Um, 
because those meals are customized. It's very personal. Um, if, if, if I'm cooking for a vegan, I have one vegan client. I have another client who's keto, another one who's gluten-free. I mean, everyone's tastes and needs are different. So it is very personalized. I don't have one menu and you, 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 you are, you are forced to pick off of that menu. And those are your only options. I throw the menus out. And I ask people, you tell me what you want me to make for you. Mm-hmm. That's one version of that. But a personal chef who is working for one person or family, um, it has a lot to do with the food and you really do need to know how to cook properly and you need to know. Okay, I think we lost her for a second. She'll be right back. Uh, Mary Ruth is talking about uh, the differences between being a personal chef and- How to, you need to- Hello? Uh, you're, uh, you're back. Okay, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that, John. Oh, no, it's um, fine. <laughs> but what I was going to say is, um, I don't know where it got cut off, but I will say that a personal chef does have to know how to cook and, and know their way around the kitchen. But what the, a personal chef um, has to have as a skill, unlike a restaurant chef, is the ability to talk to your client and leave your ego, check your ego at the door. Because when you're working as a person for as a personal chef mm-hmm. and that's your career, it's not about you as much as it is about the people you're cooking for. So if they want grilled cheese every day, then you make grilled cheese every day. You make the best grilled cheese that you absolutely can. You make it the way they love it, but you don't question it. And if they don't like your grilled cheese, you don't say, well, that's the way it's supposed to be. You say, how can I make it better? How do you want me to make it? Being a personal chef is really about um, the relationship that you have with the people that you're cooking for and the trust that is um, instilled and that is gro- that grows between you and your client um, over time. Uh, so it's a very unique career. It's not for everybody. You have to smile through a lot of frustration, but that's one of the skills is smiling. Yeah, that's and that's really cool too because I think that uh, you know if 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 you are hiring somebody to work uh, you know work on your your uh, your nutritional needs right and and your likes and your dislikes you really aren't necessarily open to their pers- per, uh, their interpretation of how something's supposed to be. And and I think that that's very interesting because for me, if I was to hire a personal chef, I don't know what I should be eating. I don't know what I should like. I don't know because I've been cooking Chef Boyardee my entire life and uh, just hoping that I can get it off the kettle when it's done. You know, that's, that's all I care about. So I, I, do you ever, do you find that sometimes uh, the client doesn't necessarily know what they want? And that they're open to whatever you could bring to the table. Yes. Yes. A lot of times they do want some suggestions and they want creativity. They definitely want to see that you can be creative, but what you also really have to be as flexible. So if they loved your marinara last week, and then for some reason they don't like it this week, you can't take it personally. You have to just, you know, be very patient with the process because there is a lot of joy what, what I would say is if, if you're somebody's personal chef, if, you, if, if, if you're thinking of going into culinary for a, for a career and you want to think about being a personal chef, it's a big sacrifice. You will give up a lot of time with your family and friends, um, but you will, if it's the right relationship, you will gain um, so much more. And that is, you know, I was really fortunate to have that happen for me where the relationship was really about, um, it was, I mean, it was a very loving relationship that I had uh, cooking for the family I cook for. And I was lucky. Uh, it can be very harsh. And I have had that situation happen as well. So there's a big difference between loving what you do and hating what you do. And when it was harsh for me, I got out of cooking for a year. So that's how bad it can be and hard it can be when it's not a good relationship. Sure. And, and, you know, I, I think food is such a personal thing and, and we live in a time now where it doesn't matter what level of food service somebody may be working in, people want it the way they want it. And they're going to tell you if it's not the way. They that always they will. It, yeah, you know? they absolutely will. And, so I, and you have to just be okay with that. 
Yes, it's, you can't, and I like how you said you can't take it personally. I think a lot of people, myself included, you know, whatever we do, uh, we 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 put a little bit of ourself into it, and when somebody doesn't necessarily like what we did or doesn't necessarily agree with how we did it, we do take that personally. And I, I think that just having that self control and being able to show, like, you know what, I'm going to take this feedback and I'm going to grow from it. That that's a big that's a really big skill set that any person can have. So that's really awesome that you're able to to do that because I have to give you great credit. <laughs> well, because it's not for everyone. There's a lot of people. In fact, I would say there's very few people in my own circle of people, whether it's family or friends, who could be in the kitchen and you know deal with some critique when you don't you don't agree with the person and handle it professionally and not take it and not become emotional about it. You just, it's, it's a, it is, it requires a certain amount of, uh, you know, you have to develop a bit of a thick skin. That's very cool. So yeah, and that's great because I think that comes into the next set. So we talked about uh, the personal chef aspect of it and now catering yeah. and catering. Um, I'm, I gotta be honest with you. I don't really know what goes into it other than, okay, I have a hundred people. I have 10 people. I have whomever. And uh, I'm one of these people that just doesn't want to think about it. I want to write a check and give it to somebody and say, you deal with this. I'm going to leave now. <laughs> that's, that's a caterer's uh, dream client. Right? <laughs> so when you get married, you just uh, let me take care of all of those things, John. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, oh. and, and it's great to hear because literally I, I, I have, I find, uh, I, I gotta tell you. So a few weeks ago, uh, I just, I bought a house a year ago, a few weeks ago, I just got a roof and up until this roof I've done, my girlfriend and I did all the work on this house. It was fantastic to just write a check. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not have to lift a finger, right? Not have to think yeah. about it. So, okay. So let's say that uh, I'm coming to Mary Ruth's catering business and, uh, I have uh, 20 people and uh, 18 of them have some ridiculous dietary restriction. Like they can't even look at gluten because it's going to give them some yes. effect. How do you handle a situation like that? I say, whatever you need, just let me know. Interesting. I will take care of it. I am all about, and this is maybe, you know, and, and, and maybe every caterer is different as well. I'm, I, I'm not speaking for anybody but me as a mm -hmm. caterer. Coming from a personal chef background, I want everybody to feel that they can, they will enjoy the meal. I want everyone to feel like for that event, they are, you know, they are that my one and only client and I want to cook for them as if I am. And so they can come to me and say, well, I got two vegans in the crowd and I do have some gluten. Can you give me some gluten-free options? Um, it requires more planning and it requires more work, more cooking for sure. Um, but I just ask everybody to be as specific as possible. Tell me what you love, tell me what you hate, and then tell me all the dietary needs and restrictions of your guests or you, sure. and I will customize a menu. So we work out menus ahead of time, dishes and menus ahead of time, so that the flavor, so that nobody's missing anything, that there's plenty of, um, plenty to um, choose from for, uh, for all people at that particular event. That's, that's really interesting because, you know, for me, I, I think about like growing up and hearing, you're going to eat what we have on our table. You're going to like it or you're going to go with that. <laughs> and that might be a, what, you know, to keep it simple for, for maybe some restaurants and for some caterers, they have to say, here's my menu. And, you know, mm -hmm. and they maybe provide some of these, alternative options on their menus. What I'm always afraid of though, and it's from being a personal chef is people, well, you know what, but I don't really like garlic, you know, but I, I can't eat tomatoes. So I might have a vegan pasta dish on there that's about tomatoes. And then someone's gonna say, but I can't eat tomatoes. They don't agree with me. I have to always be ready to have something else that's j not just another option, but that's an amazing option. Sure. And that's, that's what I'm always working on is wanting it to be perfect and special and amazing for each and indiv each individual person. 
that's that's just so nice to hear that it's that experience from beginning to end making it good that's that's and, great. and one other quick thing that you mentioned where you don't have to lift a finger where you can enjoy your guests you can enjoy your time you don't do dishes you don't set up you just have me take care of all of that that's great I guess <laughs> at your own party <laughs> That's that's so cool. So when you you know you're, you're starting, uh, somebody comes to you, and uh, have you ever had a situation where they have a, a dish that you may not be very familiar with? Uh, yes. And and I'm sure there's a lot of practicing before the main event. I would assume, right? You're you're testing. Yes. That. Yes. I don't always not. So recently, uh, back at, around the holidays, I did have somebody ask me to make a dish. I just you know. I'll tell you, I just hadn't made chicken paprikash before. I just hadn't made it. It wasn't ever on my on my list of requests or needs. And so I found an amazing chicken paprikash recipe. And I knew it was amazing because I've been doing this for so long, just by looking at the recipe and then knowing how I could tweak it. Mm -hmm. Something long enough to kind of learn a little bit about um, what the process is going to look like. So if it's a new dish, um, I will, I can't, I mean, I'm, I mean, truth be told, I don't always practice. I just look at something and I know whether or not it's going to be good and worth, worth making. Sometimes I will, if it's a very complicated recipe, I have made, made it ahead of time. But mm -hmm. um, when you, when you are comfortable in the kitchen, you're kind you kind of can be comfortable with experimentation. So if somebody asks me to make something I've never made before, I'm really comfortable. If I, if I feel I have found a recipe that meets what they're looking for and what my skill set is. Fantastic. That's you know awesome. what? You, you are just signing the check for me right now. You know, I'm thinking about this. I'm like, how can I hire her right now? Uh, you know, that's, oh my gosh, it's so cool. So let's, let's go. Uh, we're going to, come back around to uh, ingredients because you've talked about that a couple of times. I want to talk to you about those in a minute, but what about, you know, as a, as a chef going through culinary school in Italy, who are some of your influences uh, chefs that may be well-known or may not be well-known? So as I mentioned at that point, um, when I wanted to become a chef, I really didn't have anyone other than the shows I was watching. There were no restaurants in Buffalo other than, on uh, the restaurant San Marco in Amherst, they do a beautiful, uh, authentic Northern Italian menu. So I got to know them and the, that their food, and I really was learning from uh, a few. This is before the Food Network was a thing, mind you. Foodies weren't a thing back in the nineties. It was kind of coming to starting, starting to come around. I was subscribing to a few cooking magazines like Gourmet and Bon Appetit, and I would, you know, again, I would try and make these dishes. But my influences were cookbooks that I was drawn to. Nobody that was famous. I have, you know, I have a wonderful cookbook by Julia Childs. Those were some majorly, if not her classic French one. It's <laughs> complicated recipes. You know, kind of rest bit intimidating. So I wasn't drawn to those. Um, I wanted to, I was drawn to the dishes that I would want to make and then have 10 people over because it would be like um, a celebration just to have, just to be together. That would be the reason to celebrate the fact that we were eating at home around the table, not going to a restaurant. So my influences were cookbooks that, uh, that honestly were meeting my personal needs of how I wanted to cook. But then again, there were these shows on Discovery Channel had a show called Great Chefs, Great mm -hmm. Chefs of the West, Great Chefs of the World, um, Great Chefs of France, blah, blah, blah. These were all really wonderful chefs from different restaurants. And, 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 and their talent was inspiring to me. But as I said, this woman, who her name was Biba Caggiano, had a restaurant in Northern California in Sacramento. And her cookbooks, I, I, I just knew I, I was, a, a, it was, it was who I wanted to emulate and um, whose food I wanted to prepare was something that was authentic and real and healthy because it was authentic and um, kind of brought people together around the table. 
So authenticity. So that really is a good uh, segue to what I want to talk about now about ingredients. So there is something to be said, uh, whether it's, you know, whatever you're doing, using the best ingredients as possible, you could be, or materials rather. So how do you know that this particular uh, brand of olives, for, uh, so to speak, is better than this type of olives? That you well, get for like uh, ninety five cents. <laughs> how do you, how do you... So if you're if you're kind of like a newbie newbie to the kitchen and you're opening up a, um, some cookbooks and you've been wanting to cook for your girlfriend or you want been wanting to cook for your mom and dad, just you you bring your whole family together at Thanksgiving or whatever it is, and you're looking at recipes, you you're going to make if you're new at this, you're probably going to make a couple of you know, it's going to be not mistakes. You're not going to make mistakes, but you're good. It's going to be trial and error. Let's just use the example that you used of olives. Canned olives, bad. Bad. Don't keep them in your cupboard. Don't even take them right now and just, you know what, make your garbage a little heavier for those guys and <laughs> use a, a, a more if you're if you're trying to cook something that has the try and get as close to the original ingredient as possible so those canned olives have been processed and they're sitting in whatever they're sitting in in that can they taste like something but they don't taste very good mm -hmm. so you know you're going to find then there's pitted kalamata olives at in a jar and those aren't bad keep those around versus the canned ones um, you're going to, and maybe if you're, if you're, if you're inclined, taste it by both. So this is a matter of like, why would you use fresh basil versus dried basil? There's a reason that some things call for a dry ingredient versus a fresh ingredient. So you just, if something calls for basil, you just can't go to your spice jar and pull out that dry basil. You have to go to the store and get the fresh basil and, you know, take the time to get the best tomatoes. Why don't you buy tomatoes in the middle of winter? They don't taste good. They're not in season. Is that, a, not, that probably right. idea? season has a big part of it. Cheeses. There's you want to get as close to an, an original delicious ingredient as possible. It's the reason you use butter versus margarine. It's 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 it, 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 I'm trying to think of all different kinds of cuisines. Um, it's not just about gourmet cooking. This is not about being fancy. This isn't about being skilled. It's about buying the best quality ingredients. Why, you know, craft Parmesan cheese, like bottled lemon juice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I'm in someone's house and I see those things, I secretly just want to like <laughs> just move them out of my, I mean, I, I just, I am, I understand why like shortcuts are, necessary if you're busy and if you're if you need to put meals together on a daily basis and you just don't hit you're you're tired that you need some shortcut ingredients but it's better to use like two or three rather than having like a kitchen full of fake ingredients just mm -hmm. two or three real ingredients you will always be able to make wonderful dishes with things like having olive oil in your house butter garlic salt pasta rice and some chicken. You can make and some vinegar. You can make a hundred million things with those ingredients. Uh, it's 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 really about eating um, the truest form of an ingredient. I that guess is, I can describe it. That so I guess uh, I'll be honest. You know, sometimes I'll be following a recipe, and uh, and oh, I didn't have that. Well, I'm gonna Google a substitution for that, and uh, see what comes up now. Uh, That's okay. That's that okay to do that. Sure. Because, you know, sometimes you'll find like, oh, this type of uh, you know, extra virgin olive oil, maybe you don't have like the extra virgin olive, but it still works. Or maybe uh, sure. kosher salt as opposed to rock salt. Or Can you just, that's all, all those kinds of, certain substitutions are really fine. And Google is a wonderful resource. I've used it many, many, many times in cooking. And it's, I think you just have to know then if you're going to substitute what to expect. So if you're going to use table salt versus kosher salt, you have to know that table salt is saltier than kosher salt. So use less of it. 
kind of know what your substitute by using a substitute what it really means. It's all really very do it is just food, but kind of kind of have a sense of all right. If I'm making a substitution, be kind of um, willing to again the flexibility has to be there and and um, be knowledgeable of that it might not taste the same as the recipe. Mm-hmm. And then maybe that is so, but that's okay. So like if, if you don't have, again, it, this is all a matter of if you don't have, if you want to make something with seafood and you don't have salmon, so you use halibut, that's okay. Just know the difference in cooking those two things and the flavors are going to be different. Always just don't be afraid to try substitutes. Don't be afraid to cook. Just use the best ingredients you can afford. So um, if you can only afford a little bit of freshly grated Parmesan cheese, do that versus buying a big can of it so that you never run out. <laughs> it's just it's just a good rule. It's, 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 you know, I, I laugh because a lot of the stuff that I, I wrote up in our question outline that I sent to you, yeah. I've done and I'm guilty of. <laughs> so. But I think most cooks have. I think most cooks have done that, including my mother. You know, it's been... <laughs> many times <laughs> but you, you never know maybe you'll find out that uh that uh, oh it worked yes. so let's talk uh, you you did bring a video and a recipe and i want to get to that no. in a minute no. but why do you think people are afraid to cook why is it so intimidating well because i i, I can speak from personal experience there's nothing worse than making something for someone and having it not come out not everyone is always going to be kind and say, "Oh, it's okay." Um, it, it there's it's it's a very um, hard thing to put your heart into something. We talked about this earlier, and have it and when you know it doesn't come out right, and you can't do it. You know, there's no do over. You just have to get up the next day. And um, me plus the other thing is, I think people look forward to their next meal. I know I do mm-hmm. with great anticipation <laughs> going out to dinner. If you know someone's cooking you a dinner or you have planned to cook that special dinner for somebody, we real. I mean, we, we, I think that's why fast food does so well. It never disappoints. It's not good for you. Um, it's, you know, McDonald's and Olive Garden and all the bad food, all the bad places that I don't like. Um, they're satisfying. They are. And that's why they do so well. When you go to make a dinner or when you go to make a meal, there's no guarantee it's going to come out. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not processed Mm -hmm. sort of dealing with all kinds of different things that can make that thing go wrong. Could be a phone call. I I had different things could, could blow everything up in the kitchen uh, and your best efforts uh, go right down the drain, literally right down the trash. So I think that's why people are afraid to cook is that it's, there's so many unknowns. Yes. And there's the, the, the desire to please and the fear of rejection. So I think those things make cooking extremely intimidating for a lot of people. You know, I, I, uh, you know, having, uh, been the predominant cook in our my household uh, for the last year. Um, I've had a lot of uh, faux pas, <laughs> as they say. But you know what? I you know there was the one time that I thought I purchased. And, and you, uh, believe me, I did everything you've said I shouldn't do right now. So I thought I purchased a prefabricated um, uh, chicken parmesan patties, uh, and I, I took them home and I put them in the oven. I was so excited, and I cut up fresh uh, mozzarella and I put it on there, and I let it bake over it. Oh, it looked amazing! And I had a nice spaghetti and a sauce and all this stuff, all, all opened up from a can, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> so we're cooking and we're cooking, and my girlfriend and I sit down at the table, and uh, she's like, "This is a very interesting chicken." I said, "I know, I can't figure it out." <laughs> Turns out it was breaded flounder, not chicken. 
<laughs> classic. And, uh, classic. I love it. And she's still with you. And she's still with me. And you know, the funny thing is, is I said, well, maybe flounder parmesan hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> <laughs> you have created a whole new trend. And, and, and you know, what's funny too, is because when I grabbed the bag out of the freezer at the grocery store, healthy, uh, fresh, authentic ingredients, um, <laughs> It looked like a chicken parm patty with sauce of and bacon. It does. Said, of course it looked like Oh, it. it was great. I didn't know it was fish. Oh, well, there it is. Didn't kill us. We're here to tell the story. That's right. And that's the best <laughs> part. And she's still with you. I, uh, think yes. Lou, I think Lou might have walked out forever on that one. <laughs> <laughs> a bite of what he thought was chicken. And a he can't deal, deal with our dog's fish snacks. Uh -huh. So he can't be took a bite of something that he thought was chicken and it was fish. Oh, it's, oh, it's crazy. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about this recipe that you brought. Yes, yes. I, I'm going to put a picture of it here. And to those of you who are viewing this uh, on the live stream, you'll be able to see the ingredients uh, come up on the screen. If you're watching this uh, or listening to it, rather, I'll post these later on so that you can see them. So Mary Ruth, what is this dish right here? This dish, I decided to make this dish because it is my absolute favorite pasta um, that I've made um, many, many times. It's called Bucatini alla Matraciana. It's a dish from Rome. Um, and one of the things that makes it unique is the type of pasta. Bucatini is a hollowed, a hollowed out spaghetti. So it's got a quite a nice bite to it. And it's a little, it feels a little bit thicker than a regular spaghetti. And a um, couple of other things, the cheese instead of Parmigiano Reggiano, which is, you know, the ch king of cheeses, um, this cheese, this pasta uses Pecorino Romano cheese, um, which is made in Rome, made near, you know, in, in that area, um, which is a sheep's milk cheese rather than a cow's milk cheese. And it has a nice assertive flavor to it. Um, Pecorino Romano. We all love both cheeses, probably most likely, but a really fresh, pecker, freshly grated Romano cheese. It, it really um, makes this particular pasta sing in a whole different way. Um, and the other um, component of this particular dish is the type of bacon. Now, what I I typed up this recipe specifically the way I typed it up back 25 years ago when I was in school. If you can get your hands on the cheek of the pig, which is guanciale, and I have seen it locally. I don't want to, it, it should not be an intimidating ingredient. Unfortunately, it might be, um, but I've seen it at a Wegmans and I've seen it at Premier. Guanciale, the cheek of the pig, is just an amazing and um, delicious cut of the animal and that it's very authentic to this dish. However, it isn't always easy to find. I did not use it in the dish I made that you're looking at. And I use pancetta, which is the uh, just it's an it's an Italian bacon. That's it's like our bacon. It's just smoked, but not cured. So pancetta is a fine substitute. But guanciale again. So this is where you're always trying to get to the closest of the most authentic ingredient. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Pancetta is widely available. And um, pancetta should be used if you can't get the guanciale. I would not recommend using American bacon, but if you want to, it just, you have a very, it just is going to taste different. I'll be honest. It's going to taste a little bit different. And then the dish um, is very, very, comes together in less than half an hour. Very cool. So I, I have this, uh, you know, how to, the recipe, how to cut it off, uh, yeah. put it together. So I'm going to add this uh, to our Facebook page so that viewers at home can look it up. But uh, we do have a little video here uh, and I would love you to just tell us sure. exactly what you're doing, uh, how you're doing it and how you get your pan to be that clean. Because uh, I was just so amazed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the, it's the simple things I know. I know. It is. I mean, it, it isn't always easy to. That, that's the, not the fun part of cooking for yourself. It's the cleanup, right? Oh, never, never. That's the part <laughs> we all hate. It's the. I don't really love that part either. But you have to just. It's all part of the joy of eating at home together. <laughs> all right. So here we go. Okay. All right. All right. So what's going on? So in this, for this particular dish, you need a large saute pan, 
Your largest one would be helpful. And you need about a um, quarter of a cup, four tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. And you get that going. So this, this is a pasta that has no garlic. So if you're not a fan of garlic, you're in luck. But it has a nice spice to it. So I got the, the olive oil going and added some crushed red pepper. You can do that to taste. You can um, add your, you can add more spice or less spice. And then what I cooked initially was the pancetta. Here, one second. I'll go back. Sorry. It goes quicker than I thought. So okay. here we go. <laughs> so, so once it, once the, once you could kind of smell the aroma of the chili pepper, you add your pancetta and, or your guanciale, your diced bacon, and you let that cook. You don't want it to get crispy, crispy. You want it just to get nice, um, a kind of like a nice golden brown. And I, so I would say that it takes about five minutes, five to six minutes to get it to a golden brown. And then after it gets to that point, um, you want one large red onion that's been sliced. And what you want to do is you're going to, you're going to, with a slotted spoon, you'll take out that cooked uh, bacon, that cooked guanciale, and you transfer that to a dish. And then you need to add, and that's what that's what we see here. I I still want the some of the fat from the meat to stay in the pan. That is what that is what helps create the sauce. And then you add, the, but while you're making the sauce, you add the red onion, and that red onion has to cook for a bit. So that cooks for about ten minutes, so that it's very very soft. Um, you want to cook that on a medium low heat. And I'm tossing that so the onions are fully coated in that olive oil. And you cook them until they're cooked down for about, and it will take about 10 to 12 minutes minutes to get them nice and soft. You don't want to rush that process. The fresh tomatoes that I used in this dish, we talked about tomatoes a few minutes ago, are a Campari tomato. Tomatoes are not in season, no matter how, how much we can, uh, the regular tomatoes. Um, so I use a Campari tomato. Um, they're, they're a little bit sweeter. And what I do is I seed them. I do squeeze the seeds out. You don't have to do that. I do that. Um, the recipe does uh, encourage you to take the seeds out. And I just dice them. And then I cook my pasta. And that, so after those onions have cooked for 10 minutes, I throw the tomatoes in there, turn up the heat, Throw the bacon back in there. Oh, there's my assistant. <laughs> I'm a good assistant. That my Barbie is my number one. So you, you, she's doing all the work actually. <laughs> but you add those tomatoes to your onions, and this is where you crank the heat. Let the tomatoes and the and the um, onions cook together. Put the bacon back in there. 60 seconds. Just another. Just get toss it all together, and then all you need to do is finish your pasta. Throw your pasta into your pan. So your pan needs to be big enough to hold the pasta, which is what we're, you're going to see here. A lot of pasta dishes call for a pound of pasta. This particular dish calls for 12 ounces. So you really get plenty of sauce, which is um, what you want. If you want enough pasta and you want enough sauce. But fresh parsley and then your grated Pecorino Romano, and that is the dish. Oh. Now, toss it together off of the heat. At this point, you don't want the cheese to get stringy. Um, a flame on that pan might cause the cheese to get kind of melted and stringy. You just want it to coat the pasta very, very nicely. And you put it in your serving dish. You can add more grated cheese. You can add more parsley. You can, Again, pass the um, crushed chili pepper if people like a little more kick. So that way people can kind of um, customize it themselves at the end. That is fantastic. And you know what? I, I Like I said, I'm going to share this recipe and the video of uh, the different ways of cutting up the ingredients uh, so that everyone can see. Uh, I know I'm definitely going to be trying this because... Uh, oh, you know, I encourage you. You must try it. If it I, I get, all you need are the ingredients. So whatever time it takes to shop and then 30 minutes to make it. That's that's. It's great. You make it look so easy. You know, I it's. I promise. I always <laughs> say it's easy because I want people to cook. I, I tell everybody everything's easy because I just want them in the kitchen cooking. That's so cool. All right. So I got a couple, a few more questions for you and then I'll, sure. I'll let you go. Cause I know that you have taken time out of your busy schedule to be here oh, with us. My pleasure, though. And uh, I just want to really check in on the comments here for a second. Um, 
you know, so our good friend Kyle Mecca said that uh, he loves Mary Ruth. I had the privilege one night to work under her for a special dinner to investors. I'll never forget it. Of course, he's referring to uh, working with you for the investor dinner for the big driver sh uh, shoot, rather, excuse me, shoot. Uh, let's see. Uh, my girlfriend told me uh, bye bye canned olives in our fridge. Okay, well, bye -bye. She, she gave it away. Fantastic. Thank you, Edison. Uh, she also said she feels like she's watching Food Network. That's what I was aiming for. So good. Awesome. I um, said, dear friend of mine, Louise uh, DeRay is there. Hi, Louise. So, oh. Louise, I've had the, the honor and pleasure of cooking for Louise and her husband, Vinny, for several, several meals. She's just a, a wonderful, wonderful woman who loves Italian food just as much and loves to cook as well. Oh, sounds great. Oh, and then we got some emojis here. Oh, what people just applaud and love everything they have. Uh, Gary oh. Levine. Hi, Gary. <laughs> he is a dear friend of Lou's who he graduated with. And his wife, Margie, was a um, my algebra teacher. Well, that's oh. a <laughs> um, And then one of my helpers, um, I'd like to say hi to Heather who I miss so much. Hi, Heather. Hi, sweetie. We're going to be back together soon. Heather is a wonderful assistant of mine. Oh, that's so nice that they're able to come in and watch uh, you speak with us today. Um, nice to see everyone's comments. Mary is my sister-in-law. Who I'm I, love. I love you, Mary. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Oh, it's so neat. And you know what? I, I I think I would encourage if you try this dish at home, send us pictures uh, on Facebook so that we can see it and we'll share it with Mary Ruth. So and can that, I mention that if you're going to make it and have any questions, please let me know. That's so cool. I'll, I'll put uh, your 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 fit your yeah. uh, information up there for everybody to see. All right. So why don't we take a second to just come back to the conversation here? Uh, and uh, let's see. How do I turn? There we go. Cool. So. Let's see, why is it, and I, I, you, you kind of touched base on this a little bit, but I, I really want to see if we can do this. You, you always watch these cooking shows where you have these chefs that are from France, from Italy, uh, Spain, uh, all over the world, and they just look down on American cooking, and they're I, like, oh. I know, I know <laughs> what you're saying, and I, I know where you're going with that, and it's not, and we, we have touched on it, and I mm. think. It's, it's helpful to, to address it politely um, because I don't know if people look, I just, I think that over the course of probably 50 to 60 years or so, mm -hmm. Americans have um, tended to go with what was convenient um, for different reasons, um, whether it's, you know, uh, TV dinners in the mm -hmm or 60s, whenever that was, and housewives were like, yay, finally, thank you. I don't <laughs> plan a meal, finally. Um, and I do, you know, I don't, I gotta, I really want to be careful about these things um, because it, it's, it's, it's a wonder, our country is a wonderful, wonderful country. But I do feel that we gear our, I feel that we don't focus on quality. Very good. If the rest of the world is looking down on us a, a little bit, and I don't know if they are, I don't know. I think it's maybe because of all those canned olives. Let's, <laughs> let's make it all about the canned olives. Okay, they are the culprit. Um, and, the, and the canned Parmesan cheese. Um, <laughs> that because as a country, we have companies who can make those things, Lunchables, you know, Oscar Mayer Lunchables, bad. Those are just bad things. You, you should, should not be consuming them. Mm -hmm. that uh, fast food, all of these things. So I think that if, if people question our diet, I think it's because we have, we, we don't always have the best choices. You know, it's, it's interesting it's you bring that up. The choices. And, you know, there's, I just watched a documentary on this on Netflix. There's a show called history 101. And it talks about uh, fast food. Actually, the first episode is fast food in America. And it, it talked about how fast food, like you said, was a convenient thing. People uh, used it as a treat originally in the 50s and 60s, going out with the family, going to the drive-in, getting their, you know, getting that. And uh, as time went on, the need to get ingredients that could last a little longer, that were scientifically um, 
fixed, so to speak. Uh, it it's really <laughs> yeah, engineered, yeah, GMOs. Um, it, it, it's interesting. So I would definitely recommend that because I think that really hits home what you're trying to say here. And I, I don't want to, I hope I wasn't putting you on the spot about no, that. I, just, I mean, I, I could get, I could talk about that for forever because it's, it's very, very frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's an economic thing. Sure. Sure. It's, so it, it makes yeah. sense. It makes, I'm sorry. I, you, you cut out on that. Feel like they can't afford to eat healthy. It's, that is not how it is in, in some of these European countries that you met. It doesn't matter. I mean, like if in Italy, everybody is, has, wants to use, it's a passion. Eating properly in, Fr in France, food is a passion. From childbirth, you know, to adulthood, people eat well. They want something that's the best quality that they can afford. They don't go for sh you know, the shortcuts mm -hmm. for what's, what's pure and what's, what is authentic. That's so great to hear that. That's, that's really <laughs> all it would take. <laughs> yeah, I, know. It, it, I feel like it's an easy fix, but it will, it's probably the most complicated fix because it's really hard. It's habits. Habits are formed from childhood. And um, when, if you're going to be eating sugar coated cereals and, you know, Lunchables and then, you know, McDonald's for your three meals, it's very hard then to take that four-year-old when they're 14 and say, you know what, here, now you're going to eat some <laughs> out of olives and, <laughs> and you're going to like it. <laughs> it's, it it's, it's definitely a, um, a, a real frustration to see our, our bad choices mean, you know, bad health bad sure. and, and, ex and expensive health care. It's sure. All, it's all tied together. It is. And and hopefully one day we're able to figure out a policy that will work on all these avenues that for some time we've known have been opportunities of. Yeah, um, because that pasta I made, I just want to say like that pasta I made, I don't know if it cost, I don't maybe it cost six bucks to make that, six, seven bucks to make that. And what I made would feed four to six people. So it you know, ingredients don't have to be expensive to be to be good. So that's, um, I think that's a misnomer that uh, to cook healthy means you need to spend a lot of money at the grocery store. You don't, you truly do not. So. Well, thank you for sharing that. And thank you very much for uh, taking the time uh, to speak with me today because I've learned an awful lot. And, and I think that it's really nice to have a perspective on uh, from somebody who is working in an area that is so important. I mean, food and eating, uh, that's, that's a good portion of health. And knowing that better ingredients can make a better yes. dish and a better health for you. So that's, that's really awesome. Food is everything. So thank you very much, Mary Ruth. Before we leave, I have one more question. Oh, sure, sure. And, and you know, we have, uh, we have chefs like Julia Child, very well known for her contributions of, you know, French cooking. Emro sure. Lagasse, he's got a huge following. I know, I don't think he's on television anymore, but he <laughs> has products. Um, sure. Paula Dean, Bobby Flay, Rachel Ray. Are any of these people trailblazers in the, in the oh, industry? Course. Or are we just really good at marketing? <laughs> it's both. I mean, the Food Network has become, um, you know, it's, 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 it's evolved into something that really doesn't even resemble food anymore. Um, but many of those people you mentioned are absolute trailblazers and the best in their field. So Bobby Flay and Julia Child um, and, you know, even Ina Garten, there are some chefs out there, you know, that, as cooks or chefs, we should aspire to 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 cook like that person, um, and, and and learn something from that person. But there are many trailblazers in these last fifty years in in, in America who we can learn so much from and um, be be creating recreating their dishes for our own for our own families and friends. 
Well, thank you very much for your insight. I appreciate it. If you just want to stick around for a minute, I'll be right back with you. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today was Mary Ruth Rera, and uh, we were very happy to have her today. Uh, I am very pleased that she was able to stop in and chat with us about all things food. Uh, please, if you have a moment and you enjoyed what you saw, feel free to like and subscribe to Why Bother on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, in our next episode, we will be streaming live to YouTube as well. So you'll be able to view us on that platform. Follow us on Facebook at Why Bother Podcast. I'd like to thank uh, this month's sponsor, Kruttinger Puppets. And I would like to announce that we are now available on Spotify, Breaker, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Radio Public, and Anchor. Uh, I am John Sebleski, and this has been another episode of Why Bother? <laughs>